nobody's done all rise for me in three years. I kind of like that. Thank you, Judy, for the lovely introduction and for the idea, because I understand it was your idea that I should be given this honor. Special thanks to Pauline Schneider and Jamie Gorelick and Arlene Holt Baker, who co-chaired the host committee to this event. Thanks to the family of the late Judge Louis Oberdorfer and the Lichtman team, Elliot and Judy, who introduced us to Mississippi and without whom I would not be here today. And thanks to the many friends who have made the effort to be here and have opened their wallets for the Mississippi Center for Justice. When Judy wrote to me and asked if I would accept this honor, I said yes quickly before she changed her mind. <laughs> but then I set two conditions for myself. First, because I had not set foot in Mississippi for years, I resolved to go to Jackson and pay a visit. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And second, I appointed myself a surrogate for the dozens of lawyers who went to Mississippi in the 1960s, all of whom deserve to be honored as forebears of what is now the Mississippi Center for Justice. By the time I first arrived in Jackson in March 1969, the earliest and bravest of those lawyers had already secured the beachhead and moved on. Al Bronstein to Plaquemines Parish and on to the ACLU prison project. Marion Wright to Washington, to the Children's Defense Fund, and to Peter Edelman. <laughs> Elliot Lickman to work for Joe Rao. Lackey Rowe, I think, to the ministry. But Reuben Anderson, Fred Banks, and Mel Leventhal were hard at work in Jackson, uh, right across Ferris Street at the Inc. Fund. If you don't know what the Inc. Fund is, that's the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Inc. Armand Durfner and Jim Lewis were up the street at LCDC, which is the Lawyers Constitutional Defense Committee of the Roger Baldwin Fund of the American Civil Liberties yeah. Union. <laughs> and at the Lawyers Committee, or the President's Committee as it was then known in Mississippi, were Larry Ashenbrenner, the passionate Larry Ashenbrenner, Martha Wood, who became city council to Charles Evers and is now a judge in Chicago, Bob Fitzpatrick, who taught me how to pick a jury. Larry Ross, who is here from New Jersey. Larry had to shave his mustache for Judge Marshall Perry. And of course, the Lawyers Committee's voting rights genius, Frank Parker. Yes. Absolutely. Up in Oxford, with North Mississippi Rural Legal Services, were Mike Trister, John Britton, and others. Later came Roy Haber and Tex Wilson and Peach Taylor and the am amazing Constance Iona Slaughter. I accept this honor on behalf of all those people and more, not to mention the many volunteers who served shorter but just as intense tours of duty like Dan Singer, who was there with Goodman, Scherner, uh, Sch Schwerner, and Cheney. The Lawyers Committee shut down the Jackson office sometime in the late 70s or early 80s. I was a board member then, and I voted with the majority. It was an unhappy decision, but a necessary one. Our Ford Foundation support had dried up. The office seemed to have lost its steam. The mission was no longer clear. And that's why I decided I had to go back to Jackson to find out what the MCJ is up to and why it has succeeded so dramatically when only a short time ago we closed our doors, struck our tents, left town. What I discovered was a simple truth, that the Lawyers Committee's old litigation model had become obsolete, or at least that it had outlived its usefulness. In its first incarnation in Mississippi, the Lawyers Committee was all about litigation. The subject we most often discussed was impact litigation, how we're going to find the deep pockets, how to find the levers that would make the biggest change. Litigation was our hammer, 
and to a hammer everything looks like a nail. We thought we could change the world with class actions and injunctions and declaratory judgments and big money damage awards. We couldn't, and we didn't. To consider one example, uh, and it's already been mentioned, was our suit to deny tax-exempt status to the private schools, the so-called SEG academies that popped up all over the state in the wake of school desegregation. It was, if I do say so myself, a brilliantly conceived and executed piece of litigation. <laughs> But I'm not sure it changed anything. If the rule established by that case has any viability today, of course, the exempt organizations branch at the IRS would be afraid to enforce it. <laughs> Martha Bergmark and her Remarkable young staff in Jackson and Biloxi and Indianola have a litigation hammer, but it's only one of the tools in their toolkit. They understand much more profoundly than we did that court decisions are only a piece of the mosaic of social change. <laughs> they introduced me to a book that I can't recommend to you enough. I'd never heard of it before but their young people all know it, a book by Gerald Rosenberg called The Hollow Hope. That book is dry and scholarly, but it effectively challenges our assumptions about the importance of litigation and even of Supreme Court decisions in bringing about social change. You know, they actually teach law students today that court decisions aren't all that important. Sounds like heresy. But at least to my ears, it has the ring of truth. Today's Mississippi justice advocates can litigate if they have to, and that capability brings credibility, but they are also lobbyists, teachers, activists, organizers, brokers, conveners. I was going to give you a couple of examples, but you've already heard about them. I'll, I'll touch very, very briefly about them. After Hurricane Katrina, Mississippi decided to use federal grant money for purposes unrelated to disaster relief for the poor folks who had lost their houses. They filed, a, they filed suit in a federal court in Washington and some district judge <laughs> threw their case out. <laughs> Stop that. But MCA, uh, MCJ staff Button Holy, a HUD assistant secretary, showed her the problem, negotiated a solution that has restored more than, I think, $132 million to its intended purpose of rebuilding housing for more than 5,000 low-income families. And they got there a lot faster than if they'd won their lawsuit and had to go through an appeal. So I... <laughs> and then when the Mississippi legislature failed to enact laws to curb the obscene excesses of the payday lending industry, MCJ organized and is now rolling out this new Roots Credit Partnership, which is, which is stunning and, and, uh, and, and a real breakthrough. Mississippi Center for Justice is, as Martha puts it, homemade and homegrown. And that, of course, is part of the reason that it's done better than we carpetbaggers did when we were in Mississippi. But also, especially with the new Roots Credit Partnership, in its own words, the center is moving into groundbreaking territory for a social change organization, looking ahead to create a new paradigm by engaging non-traditional partners in the business and financial world. It's very exciting. The MCJ is the real deal. I am delighted to have been brought back into the fold. Thank you all very much. I have to, I have to tell you what this says.
It says with heart, heartfelt thanks to James Robertson for your lifetime commitment to the pursuit of justice for all. And there's some beautiful photographs. Thank you so much.